How are we doing this morning, Park Crest? You guys excited to be here? Yes. So as you heard, we're kicking off a, a new series uh, called Time to Dream. Uh, over the next seven weeks, my goal, my hope is to activate a God-given dream in your life. Whether that's a personal dream for you, maybe that's a vocational change or a dream or a ministry God is stirring up for you to create and launch, I want you to explore a personal dream for you. Or maybe there's a dream you have for your family. We want to look like this, God. We want to be used. We want our family to be used like this, God. We want to create a generational change, a generational transformation happening that starts right here in my family. Whether that's a dream that you have for this church, what is your unique contribution to Parkcrest? How can you serve in your unique giftings, right? Or what is your, what's your dream for the city? So how can we reach people that are far from God, that, that need the hope and love of Jesus Christ? That is all going to be explored over the next seven weeks. And I'm excited for this. I, I built this series based on a book by a person you may have heard of, Rick Warren, created this book called Created to Dream. And in this book, he outlines six phases of dreaming. It's a process of dreaming. Whether that's a little dream or a big dream, every single one of us goes through all six of these phases. And it's, it goes as follows. Phase one is the dream itself. It's receiving the dream. It's when God gives you a desire, God gives you a, a dream in your heart that it's like, okay, this is what I want to pursue. This is the purpose I feel like God is, is, is doing in my life. And, and we all know that Dreaming is kind of like a Polaroid picture. For those of you that are a little bit younger, don't know what Polaroids are. Polaroids is you take a picture, you get this like little white film thing that comes out and you have to shake it. You don't have to, but it's fun. You know, you shake it until the picture becomes clear and clear and clear. And then it takes time for it to be developed right in front of you. It's like magic, right? That's kind of what a dream does. God gives us a dream and then it takes, he uses time to develop that dream in our life. So first is planting the dream. Phase two is when you make the decision to go after the dream. That's when you, make, you decide, right? I tell my, my son all the time, he grew up, and he's like, I want to play Division I football. Great, that's an awesome dream. But a dream that doesn't drive you isn't a dream, it's a wish, right? So you, that you have to at some point make the decision to make changes in your life to go after that thing that God has put on your heart. That's phase two. Phase three is delays, we know this. God uses time to teach us. God uses time as a teacher to teach us and prepare us to receive the dream. Phase four is difficulties. God uses difficulties. God uses hard things to create and mold and shape and build our character so that we have the fortitude, we have the, the structural integrity to handle the dream. Right? It's, it's a thing that the, the, that the enemy uses things to break us, then God uses those th same things to make us. It is those difficulties that make and, and shape our character. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. So he uses his difficulties in our life to build us, to be able to withstand the dream, to make us stronger. Then phase five, we move to a place of dead end. Dead ends is like when you're standing in front of the Red Sea. You don't see a path forward. You see Pharaoh's armor coming barrel down on you. You don't see a way out of this situation. You're like, I'm stuck. I'm dead. I have no, there's, my dream is dead. That's exactly where God wants you to move you to the sixth phase, which is deliverance. God loves showing up in that point in your life where you think all hope is lost. All your dreams are dead. That thing that you've had, you've been pursuing is, is not possible because he wants to show you who he really is. He wants to make the impossible things in your life possible so that you can't take credit for those things. Only he can take credit for those things. So that's, the, that's what we're going to go over the next seven weeks. We're going to explore each of those phases so that we, every single one of you, starts having a dream for your life. And when I say every single one of you, God has a dream for you. You are not too young to dream. You are not too old to have a dream. Take a look at this verse in Acts 2. It says this, Acts 2, 17, says, in the last days God says, now check this out, Peter is saying this and he's using the prophet Joel to speak to 
2,000 years ago at the day of Pentecost. He's saying those days were considered the last days. So those days are the last days. What are we in? The last, last days? <laughs> right? So in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit and on all. Say all. all. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He says all people. He says sons and daughters, young and old. I think he checked the box on everybody. He's saying, everybody, I have a dream for you. I want to do something miraculously in your life. And the whole point of having a dream is I want to grow your faith. I want you to believe. I want you to take risk for me. I want you to do something that only I could do in your life. So every single one of you, I want to explore this dream with you. And I thought on Mission Sunday, I thought this is what we do every year on, on Mission Sunday. We, we like to get you to sign up for Mission so you can activate something in your life. And I thought it would be a perfect opportunity on Mission Sunday to interview some of our dreamers right here in our church. Because they had a dream. And they said yes to God, and God used them to do amazing things. So, first up, I want you to help me welcome three dreamers in our church, Hung, Holly, and Shannon. Can you please come up and you welcome them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited for this, guys. I, I, I'm excited because I didn't have to do as much sermon prep this week, so that was good. <laughs> But the real reason I'm excited is because I've gotten to hear their stories uh, individually. And I'm excited for you to hear their stories. And maybe you're going to start to see some threads and some common things happening that maybe you're experiencing. Because I guarantee they went through all six of those phases in order to be here today. And we're going to talk about that. So before we dive in, why don't you just give a really quick overview of the name of your ministry, your name, name of your ministry, and what do you guys do? I'm going to start out. Excellent. Hello, Parkcrest. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hallie Wolf, um, and I'm the founder of His Little Feet Nonprofit. Our mission is to share God's love and uplift youth that are facing homelessness with brand new socks and shoes. That's awesome. Good morning. My name is Shannon James, and I am the founder of Beacon for Him Ministries. We are a street outreach right here in Long Beach, uh, and our mission statement is to share God's love and hope with homeless men, women, and children by building personal relationships with them and loving them right where they're at. So, um, my name is Hong Thak, and we uh, am the founder of Parable. We enter the story of students to bring them the story of Jesus. And basically, we have on-campus uh, lunchtime clubs and after-school mentoring programs where we help do mentorship and uh, outreach to youth all over our city. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I'm going to stay with you. Because for years, you were a part of crew ministry. And recently, God gave you a new dream for Parable. Share with us, and I'm, I'll, I'll ask you guys to also answer this question. Share with us, how did you initially receive this vision, this dream, to do what God is calling you to do? Great question. Um, I heard a principal in L.A. say to me uh, a few years ago, what the news media isn't telling you is this, is that kids are going through pain, and they only know to do two things with that pain, hurt themselves or hurt other people. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, Many times the students I get to serve uh, in the public school systems, uh, they're actually uh, scared of adults in their story because the adults in their story have harmed them the most, but they also long for an adult in their story. Uh, and so we, uh, it's amazing around a, a table with some food and a, a game called Solarium where we hear the story of students, what God does in the midst of it. And a few months ago, I got to meet a student named Chris who um, basically shared that when he was three or three uh, yeah, three years old, his mom and dad sold him for crack cocaine. Mm. Uh, he gets put in the foster care system, uh, gets adopted, and he's excited about it. But uh, the, the adopted family started taking the money that was supposed to be used on him because uh, uh, he was in the foster system. And they started using it on their own biological children. Mm. And uh, he felt like a leftover. So when I met him, he was couch surfing and homeless. And I guess what happened over these years as we've served inside these schools that we got to hear the stories of students and all their pain 
And yes, we wanted to give them an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. We also wanted them to grow in their faith through discipleship. And we wanted them to reach out to their friends. But there, many of them were struggling with food insecurity. Many of them were uh, living in sheds, cars, and garages. Many of them had mental health issues, uh, four to eight childhood traumas they've never dealt with. And so we uh, partly formed this organization to not only meet the spiritual needs of students, but we wanted to holistically care for students so that they can be made whole. Because the ark of God is not just a decision for him, but the ark of God is to bring shalom back into their story, to, to bring them back to his uh, created design. And the second thing, the ache that we felt is that a lot of our students began to come to know Jesus and grow in their faith. And they wanted to, uh, they graduated college and they wanted to come back and be a missionary. But because the historical uh, nature of fundraising and support raising as a missions model is very challenging for urban people, uh, BIPOC leaders. And so uh, it took me about four years to raise funds to, to do mission work. And by and large, that's what it normally takes for BIPOC leaders. And so we wanted to uh, start an organization that helps raise up indigenous leadership so that it, they could be the ones that lead the movement and not just people who could raise funds. Amen. Amen. Shannon, that's great. You give. Similar, God used brokenness in your life and brokenness, you saw brokenness. Share with us how God gave you the vision, the dream for your ministry. Yeah. Um, so I shared earlier, uh, I didn't in initially have the dream to serve in the way I am now. It was really through uh, my friend pointing me here to Park Crest Church. Thank you, Park Crest, and Celebrate Recovery, which um, Ooh, I ended up. Recovery. Yes, anybody Celebrate Recovery in here? No? Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. We need to get some people. Okay. Hey, hey sister. <laughs> uh, I was experiencing heavy depression, mm. and um, I just didn't want to live anymore. And my friend pointed me towards Park Crest, which, if you don't know about, has a Celebrate Recovery program, which is 12-step for hurts, habits, and hangups. I did a year step study, and God dramatically changed my life. Mm, and because he did that, I just I said a vulnerable prayer from my heart use me, Lord. You've saved me. You've changed me. You've restored me. I'd never felt such freedom in my life. And I prayed this legitimate prayer to God. And I shared this earlier. Be careful when you pray prayers like that because <laughs> God showed up. He, will use he, you. he showed up the same day. Don't I prayed answer. that in the morning. I went to work and on the way home from work, I encountered a man on the center divider um, who was asking for help. We've all experienced this. And I gave him a couple dollars and I rolled my window back up and I felt the Lord stir my heart to talk to him. Mm. And uh, I did. I talked to him and he said um, that I could help him more and he stays at Lincoln Park in downtown Long Beach. And I was by Lakewood Mall at the time and I said, okay, I'll bring you some food. How about that? I'll, I'll look for you. I'll find you. And he said, if you do show up, bring a lot. There's a lot of people. Mm. And as I drove away, I was just so convicted that I, I wanted to roll my window up and keep driving. And mm -hmm. God said, no, talk to him that our God is relational, mm -hmm. and that as we um, live in right relationship with him, he's going to lead us to that relationship with others, mm -hmm. and so that's really the premise of how it started. It's so easy to be apathetic and just throw money at it and move on, it, 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 and money I'm sure helps, yeah. but I love what you're doing. You're taking a step further and, and restoring dignity, yeah. right? I yeah. love that. Thank you. Share his, his little feet. Where, how, where that, because I, because Part of the reason why we're doing this today is because we sat down, I heard when we met, I heard your story of where this vision came from. And I was like, ooh, this is, I can't wait for you guys to hear it. So how did, where, did, where did his little feet come from? Yeah, his little feet was birthed here at Park Crest Church 10 years ago in the center when we had a women's group back then. We were doing the seven experiment by Jen Hatmaker. And it was, you know, us taking a personal look into our lives and seeing we live in the land of excess in our cupboards. We have hundreds of, you know, uh, cans and, you know, food in our refrigerator, in our closets. And, and so his little feet started um, based off of the Lord tugging on my heart here at church that um, there was a school counselor that came from Jane Addams Elementary mm. to the Bible study. And she was talking about kids uh, taping the soles on their shoes and mm. rubber bands, holding them together. And um, I thought, in my city, really? Like, po I didn't know extreme poverty like this um, besides in third world countries. Mm -hmm. And so that's when um, I, be I couldn't sleep for two nights just thinking about it. 
And so I'm like, okay, Lord, I know you're doing something. So his little feet started with my two kids' shoes. Mm. I was a single mom at the time going through a divorce, and my daughter was diagnosed with PTSD. Mm. And so it was hard times for us. It was hard times, but it's also hard times for others. Mm. And so it was during that time where um, the Lord said, are you going to trust me? And Mm -hmm. I said, yes. And he said, it's going to take over everything in your life, Mm. even your career. And so I thought, um, because I, you know, being a single parent and the head of the household, how am I going to provide for my kids, let alone, you know, this ministry? And so, um, but uh, faithfully he has, you know, faithfully we, um, um, my two kids are in high school now. Mm -hmm. They were in elementary. And um, we've served over 25,000 kids in our city since 2014. Wow. 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 So I, I hope you heard a little bit the, the commonality in their stories, all of it being birthed out of pain. And some of you have extreme pain. And I want you to hear today that your pain is not wasted. God will not waste your pain. There is purpose in your pain. God is, is, is allowing this pain to, to, to activate, to, to, to stir something, to, to build something of great significance. God will not waste your pain. Clearly, right? Right? So, with that being said, um, when I was reading the the, the phases of the dreaming process, where you first receive the vision, now you're going through this process of going after that dream, make the decision to go after the dream, and then waiting for the deliverance of that dream actually happening. When I was talking about difficulties and and delays, I saw all of you guys' heads like, yep. Yep, we do that. Yep, I remember those days. What were some of the difficulties and delays that happened in your guys' ministry? And whoever wants to answer this can. Um, And what was was the lesson? What would would God teach you about that? Um, In 2020, when um, all the stores closed down, uh, Nike was a big supporter of ours. And so they would help us with all of our shoes for the year. And so all of a sudden we had zero shoes Mm. and we had this ministry and all these people were in need and so we had to litter and then to hold an event to fundraise for the kids um shoes that also no event centers were open during that time and so um the lord just really walked me through um you know a sponsorship program it's called the soul club and Mm -hmm. um every month 45 dollars a child gets a new pair of shoes and so we basically transitioned the whole ministry um during covid and now the children pre-covid got new shoes and now they get brand new shoes and um, a lot of the kids have said this is my first pair of new shoes and one child didn't even know how to open the box because they're used to just the hand-me-downs and things and so um his grades went up his confidence went up and um and so we just see you know even through the rough times we all experienced um, during that time, um, God did something greater um, mm-hmm. just by trusting him. So. Amen. Shannon, you were talking about some of the delays, uh, even with uh, we experienced some, some pushback against the police department, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to share any of that? Uh, yeah, just quickly. We, when we first started doing outreach, um, that man on the center divider led us to Lincoln Park, which uh, is in downtown Long Beach. And so I did. I, I went looking for him, pulling a wagon with food in it, and, um, and eventually just came to love the people that I was serving. And because I was coming out of my own brokenness, I just felt at home. I felt like there was no facade. I felt like they genuinely accepted me, which is crazy. You know, I just, I was out there just feeling, uh, Father Gregory Boyle, I didn't show this in first service, but, um, he has a quote in his book, Tattoos on the Heart that mm-hmm. says, service is the hallway to the ballroom of kinship. Mm. And that's what I'm that's experiencing out there in the park when we minister to people. But we began bringing food. It was me, and then I work on the docks. I'm a longshoreman, and I would go back to work, and I would say, come with me, come with me. And these longshoremen were like, okay, she won't stop talking about it. We'll, <laughs> we'll come and join her. And so we started bringing food and passing it out to people just to bring connection because when people are hungry, they can't hear mm-hmm. anything. Mm. And so we, we started feeding people and and crowds were growing and we were praying for people. We were seeing people's lives change because we were loving them and their identity was changing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, 
it was becoming quite large and the police didn't like the gathering and um, we didn't have permits because we're just out there loving Jesus mm -hmm. and loving people. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> and we started to get a lot of attention. The police came and said, if you keep doing this, then you're going to get a citation. And I just, I, I couldn't stop doing it because we just love these people. And the next week we got misdemeanor citations um, because we didn't have a permit. But God used it. That's why I giggled because um, God used it for his good and for his glory because we ended up getting a soup kitchen where we were able to invite these same people inside oh, nice. and talk about dignity. We had round and women's Bible study. Shout out to women's Bible study. We're huge supporters. Kelly and I were in that same group. The Holy Spirit was just doing crazy things in 2013, 14. And uh, we were able to bring people inside and we put tablecloths on tables and fresh flowers and just wow. God just provided so much dignity for people. It's amazing how most people would be confronted with something like that being uh, threatened to have citations and we'd be like okay I'm good I'm, I'm, I'm done with my ministry <laughs> right but yet you moved against that and, and God even showed up. Uh, another thing before hung I want to have you close this out with the last question. Um, another thing a theme I'm seeing here is that these ministries were birthed in what I call the, this God gap. The God gap is the intersection of a practical need and a, and a spiritual need. They are both filling, they're all fulfilling uh, this practical need, shoes, dignity, food, uh, 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 companionship even, right? Um, uh, they're serving a very practical need, but then also they're they're also serving a very spiritual need as well. And that's exactly what Christ did. He came and served practically, healed people, uh, the lame, the blind, the sick, healed them, but then introduced them to the kingdom, right, to the Father. So, Hung, as we close out this segment, what's the advice would you give a person that is beginning that dreaming process that maybe God has put something on their heart to go after? What, what advice would you give them at this junction? Yeah, I think um, for me, it's, uh, I think about the story in the Old Testament where God comes to Moses and says, I've heard the cries of my people, and I'm going to come down and rescue them, but I'm going to send you. And he speaks to him at, at the burning bush, and I, God reminded me this, that oftentimes when God gives us a dream for something, calls us to something, he wants us to first have an encounter with him. And I think for Moses, God had to disrupt the darkness in Moses first before he wanted Moses to disrupt the darkness in the world. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we see that God sees, uh, Isaiah sees God lifted up high upon a throne. And Isaiah's response at the end, we often talk, here am I, send me. We love that he wants to go out and serve the Lord. But before that happened, um, Isaiah had to see God for who he really is. And then he confesses that he's a man of unclean lips and lives among a people of unclean mm -hmm. lips. And I just think that um, if, if, I think if you're going to dream with God, you can't create an encounter with God, but you can create practices in your life mm -hmm. where you can hear and obey him. The last thing I would share is that uh, in uh, Old Testament, Samuel says this dangerous prayer that I would ask you to pray. Um, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I think sitting under the presence of God and having that posture to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Mm -hmm. What he speaks to you, then ask through the power of the Holy Spirit to obey. I think that's where God births dreams. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Can we say thank you to these dreamers? <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. So one of the longest partners that we've had over the course of our church's history is um, a, an amazing ministry out of Kenya to Maini uh, International. Uh, let me draw your attention to the screen. Let's watch this together. For Kenyan communities, to Maini International sows the seeds of hope. When the AIDS epidemic devastated the country, founder Stanley Matunga found his calling, uplifting families through self-sustaining programs designed to support education, health, and the economy. Every day, Tumaini works to mitigate extreme poverty through opportunities created by Kenya for Kenya. 
This is Faith. She is 16 years old and attends the Tumaini International Girls High School in Masi. When she's not studying for her classes, she spends her time playing table tennis, writing for the journalism team, and dreaming of becoming a neurosurgeon. Faith is one of over 1,600 students currently sponsored through the Tumaini Sponsorship Program, a program that supports each child's medical care, food, clothing, and school fees. More than 1,600 students have already graduated from our sponsorship program and now serve the community or manage their own businesses. Our community-based organization models offer job training and development for skills, including greenhouse farming, tailoring, and more. This is Jackson. After his father passed away, he was connected with the Tumaini Sponsorship Program, allowing him to complete his education. He later earned a security contract with Tumaini, and today, he now owns his security firm and employs other Tumaini graduates. Across Kenya, we serve more than 30,000 primary and secondary beneficiaries like Jackson, partnering with them as they launch their businesses and empowering them to address their needs. Meanwhile, our community projects, like the multi-purpose Park Crest Hall and the Kilimanjaro Guest House, serve an average of 50,000 people every year. Over in Machakos County, the Tumaini Medical Clinic treats more than 11,000 patients annually, some of whom are HIV positive or struggling with AIDS, need pharmacy access or lab work, or need treatment for injuries. We are currently expanding the clinic to a full service hospital with outpatient facilities and a maternity ward. Thanks to the foundation we've established during the last 20 years, Tumaini looks ahead to a bright future, but there's still a lot more to do. Over the next decade, we plan to complete the hospital and serve 25,000 annually, support 70,000 more beneficiaries, and serve 100,000 people at Parkcrest Hall and Kilimanjaro Guest House. You have made our journey to this point possible. You have helped us change lives. Will you join our mission and continue to bring hope to Kenya? To Maini International, inspire hope. Parkers, will you help me welcome the founder and our friend, Pastor Stanley Matunga. So I'm very excited about this. We went to lunch a couple months ago, and we easily just flew through two hours. So we, we, we could literally do this for a very long time. We're not going to do that to you. <laughs> but I do want you to hear some of the richness of, of Pastor Stanley's story and what's happening in Kenya, because it is remarkable. So real quick, we've been a partner with you for now 20 years, 20 plus years. Bring us back to the beginning. Where, where did this vision come from, and how did we get connected with you and the work that you're doing in, in Kenya? Um, thank you, uh, Pastor Anthony, for the opportunity. Um, so, to Maini, uh, which you've already seen, means hope. I don't have to explain anymore what it means. <laughs> um, goes back um, over 20 plus years. Um, I'm a native of Kenya, as you can tell. I don't speak this typical Southern California accent, so <laughs> that's where it is coming from. Uh, my wife and I, and I uh, believe she's seated here somewhere, um, we uh, co-founded this ministry after I lost two of my brothers to HIV AIDS. Uh, back in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, AIDS was an epidemic in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where, is, uh, where Kenya is, is based, and where it's located, rather. So after my brothers uh, went to be with the Lord, they left 12 kids between the two of them, and uh, one of my sisters-in-law was also sick. Um, my brothers were the breadwinners, and so the kids were left vulnerable. We were blessed enough to take care of them in terms of uh, supporting them to go through school and all that. 
But that uh, tragedy in our family opened our hearts. Um, we were cognizant of the fact that about 700 people were dying every day uh, from AIDS. That is just in Kenya alone. Mm. But it hit home when we actually lost family. And uh, we began to ask ourselves, what can we do? We are not trained to do nonprofit work, but we felt God calling us to do something. And so we began to help a few families through child sponsorship. That's where it all began. Mm, that's good. And, and then our connection to, so how did we hear about this? What was the connection there? So at the time, I um, was um, dean of graduate school and a professor at uh, Hope International University. And uh, one time we invited uh, one pastor to come and address our ministry students. That pastor's name was Roger Beard. And um, he came on a, uh, it's a typical Hawaiian chat. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then he began to explain how he transitioned from a suit to a, um, a Hawaiian shirt. You may remember that story vividly. And so that was before we founded Tumaini. So when we did found Tumaini, one of my staff was also a member of this church, mm. Michelle Lewis. She said, I think you need to meet two men, Roger Beard and St. Dave Radford. And so we made the connection, long story short, um, Roger in the following year or so with Kay and a couple of his family members came to see what God was doing in Kenya. We partnered and Dave, of course, was all fired to be the person driving the, the vision and all that. And so that is how that we connected. And uh, that. boy, that has been an amazing partnership. It has been an amazing partnership. And there are so many things that we have accomplished since that partnership began. We can't cover them all, but there's a few that I would like to highlight. For instance, in tw uh, 2007, Parkcrest, we raised enough funds to help build the Parkcrest Hall. In fact, I think we have a photo to show. Talk, talk to us a little bit. What is Parkcrest Hall and what is it? How is it being used? So initially, Parkcrest Hall was going to be our multi-purpose hall to use when kids close school. They would come, we would do, uh, we, we usually have camps where we lead them to the Lord. We connect them with the churches in their neighborhood. When the guardians come, we gather with them there. When there are community activities, they gather there. And there was a church that actually met there for many years. So it was truly a multi-purpose community center. Um, but then we thought when we really grow, we'll be 250 kids. So this would be our multi-purpose hall, dining hall and all that. And then we will build hostels for the kids. But then uh, God and other plants, we grew very fast to about five, 700 kids within three years. And so we kind of left that to just be a multi-purpose for the greater good of the community. So you, you touched on us a little bit. So a few years later, we then helped launch the, the, the yes. hospital. Yes. So in 2009, um, just the summary of it, uh, we found out that because a quarter of our kids were also HIV positive, and some of them actually sick, we were spending a lot of money buying us, uh, medicine or taking kids to hospitals that had no medicine whatsoever, the government institutions. So we feel led to start our own small um, walk-in medical clinic, and Parkrest uh, played a role in uh, planning the original uh, healthcare uh, facility, which of course has evolved now to um, comprehensive uh, to many mission hospital. And then in 2023, we raised funds to help launch the kids' wing of that hospital. And then in 2024, we raised funds to launch the Wilkins Center. Talk to us about yes. the Wilkins Center. Yes. Um, this summer, um, we, July actually, we had a team that came to Kenya from, uh, from here, uh, Park Ridge Christian Church, as well as uh, Jared's uh, wife, um, Shona, and their oldest daughter to dedicate the Wilkins Center. Uh, what we've done over the years, we've grown from one small village to seven counties. Uh, that's a large part of Kenya where we are serving now by God's grace. And one of the regions is a very Islamic uh, area. And so we have, over the last 10 years, 
I started ministry there, and Parkrest is has been part of that lately. And so you helped us uh, buy a piece of land where we have built uh, the Wilkins Center, another multi-purpose uh, hall where we are launching our seventh campus. We plant churches, by the way. Uh, and uh, it will also be serving as our uh, medical facility before we, we can build our regional hospital there. It's also our after-school program venue. That's where we carry out our after-school program. Our medical camp, when we do medical camps in that region, that's where we'll be doing. And boy, who knows what else who we knows? might do in that uh, Whatever, whatever, whatever you dream up. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So a little bit of, about what you have done as a church family over the years. So since 2020, we have donated as a church $130,000 to this ministry in, in Kenya. And amazing, amazing. Um, the other fun fact is 60 of our members, 60 of our members uh, has gone to Kenya to help serve and launch and, and, and dedicate these sites that he's talking about. Um, and that's even including the COVID break time. So we, we had a few years that we, we couldn't even go. So 60 of you raised the funds and, and paid out of your own pocket to go to be a part of what God is doing. And as a result, here's, here's some really amazing things. As a result, we've helped serve over 100,000 individuals. We have sponsored uh, 1,700 vulnerable children. 800 of those were in elementary school schools. 684 were in high schools. 99 were in vocational or special education edu uh, institutions. And 144 were in university and colleges. So this this ministry is impacting multi-generational, multi, like many levels in many ways. So Stanley, help us close out thinking about the future. What is next? How, how can we help? How can we partner? How can we, what's the next thing that we're going to go after together in, in, in your ministry? Um, we remain uh, very focused in our three pillars, education, healthcare, and socioeconomic empowerment. And I can go on into a lot of details with that. But the hospital that we've just completed uh, building, we've not completed equipping. We are still purchasing equipment. And you, I think, mentioned that Parkrest has already uh, donated to us the, our pediatric uh, wing. And uh, that is something uh, we still hoping to complete this year, uh, among other phases, but that will be a key one. Uh, but so many other things that God is doing. I love it. I love it. So as we close, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Stanley to, to pray for us because I believe that God is going to activate more of us to participate in what is going on over there, but also dream dreams for our own local communities as well. So before you pray for us, let me just make sure you guys hear at the end of the service, when we, we leave, I don't want you just leaving and not doing anything with this information. If you want to get the most out of this next seven weeks, then please be a part of a small group, a part of a community group. If you're not connected to the community group, you're going to miss out on what God is doing in this series. And for every single person that's a part of a community group, you're going to get this book for free. We're going to give it to you for free. And we're going to go through this book, and we're going to teach it on the weekends, and we're going to just go really deep into, God, what is your dream for us? What is your dream for me? What is your dream for my family, my church, my community? And we're going to discuss this, we're going to develop this, and we're going to see God do amazing things in and through us. And so here's my ask. If you are interested in helping us host a group, we need host. We need to start more groups. We have Right now, over 30 people looking to be a part of a group. And we can't get them in a group because we need more hosts. So we need you to sign up to be a host. And you don't have to be, you don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to be a preacher, a teacher. If you can open up your home, office, if you can open up, you know, set up a, a park, a place in a park, whatever. If you can host a group, we would love for you to help uh, move people into a group this, this, for the next seven weeks. But if you are not ready to host, that's fine. Then I want you to find a group. We'll help you find a group as well. So that's one thing. And then the second thing, when you guys leave, um, make sure you get some food. There's some food out there, I heard. <laughs> but also go meet all of these ministry leaders. There's more uh, people out there that'll, 
kind of walk you through ways that you can get involved. Part of what activates dreams in our life is putting our hands to work, right? When Jesus said, come follow me, it wasn't until they, the, 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 the disciples started seeing Jesus move and doing the ministry itself before they started having dreams for their future. So this is a great way to activate your faith by getting involved in doing. So sign up to be a part of a community group. Sign up to be a part of a mission uh, event or ministry this month. And let's see God move in this place over the next month or two. So with that being said, can you pray a blessing, pray a prayer over us as a church family? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Thank you for bringing each one of us here. You brought us here for a purpose. We have worshipped you through songs. We've heard your messages even through the worship leader. We have heard from Pastor Anthony and the, the burden that you put on his heart to talk about dreams and just to challenge and encourage brothers and sisters here to think reflectively as to what you are calling them to do. I pray, Lord, that you use the testimonies that have been shared this morning to trigger something in everyone's heart. You've caught every one of us, as the Book of Hearts has reminded us, that every one of us is called to do something. May you grow that dream. May your Holy Spirit stir our hearts and lead us exactly to where you want us to be. May we take action. May we not be afraid. May we trust in you, Lord. And even when things get tough, may we remember that you are the caller and ours is to be faithful and you will fight our battles. Thank you for the opportunity again to be at Parkrest and to share what you are doing in Kenya and around the world. I worship you. I thank you that we have these brothers and sisters who support us, who are there for us, who pray for us, and do give so that your work can be expanded for your honor and glory. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Sign up for a group. Go learn ways where you can start serving with one of our ministry partners. We love you. Have a blessed week. We'll see you guys next week. See you.